Well, hello, everyone. Um, we'd like to talk a little bit about baptism this evening. Um, what is the significance of baptism? What it ought to mean to us? Well, there was a lovely description of it in, in that chapter we've just read together, Romans chapter 6. Now, a very long time ago, I'm not going to tell you quite how long, um, I was taken as a very small baby, and uh, I was taken into the church, and some water was placed on my forehead, so they tell me, and that was called baptism. But of course, I didn't understand a word of what was in that chapter at that time, so it can't really have been baptism, could it? Because it's pretty clear from reading that that we are expected to know what it's all about. So let's have a look at what the Bible has to say about baptism. I'd like us to do it under, under these headings. First of all, think about the fact that Christianity changes lives. That's what it's meant to do. What are the changes? How do we make the changes? And how does baptism help the change that we have to make? What has it got to do with it? What is true Christian baptism? And then we'll just summarize our conclusions at the end. So let's begin then with the thought that Christianity changes lives. And to illustrate this, I just want to use one example. Now, I'm going to put the, uh, the references on the screen, but we may need to go and read some of the passages, because I've only put very short summaries of what they have to say in order to do it in reasonably large uh, text. So the example we'd like to take about Christianity changing lives is taken from Galatians chapter 1. So I'd like to take you there, please, to the Paul's letter to the Galatians and chapter 1. Now, I'll be quoting from the King James Version, but hopefully, if you're reading the New King James, you won't find it too, too different. Now, this little passage here, Galatians chapter 1, taken from Paul's letter to the Galatians, tells us about the tremendous change that took place in the life of Paul. We read in verse 18 of this chapter, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, Peter the Apostle, and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the Apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the, the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us, and that was the life of the Apostle Paul, he was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews, and it was his sole object to exterminate Christianity, to put out of action those who were preaching the gospel. But what do we read here now? But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. This then was the change that believing in Christianity had on the Apostle Paul's life. It turned him round completely from doing that which he thought was right, but was actually against God, to following in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he now believed. So this is the size, the magnitude of the change which Christianity should bring about in our lives. Well, what are the changes? Uh, and this is where our chapter from Romans will be helpful. Now, we won't reread all the, the passages here because uh, we, we read them together just now, but here are some of the things which Romans chapter 6 brings before us. The idea is that the believer is dead to sin and no longer serves sin. So it's a really big change in life, isn't it? A change in direction. No longer following our own way, which is sin, but instead following God's way. The change we have to make, in principle, is just as big as that which the Apostle Paul made. Of course, we were probably not, I, I, I trust, those who went around putting Christians to death before we became one. Uh, we would probably be, uh, have been locked up a long time ago if we, if we had been in this country. But nevertheless, the change we have to make in our lives really is a complete turnaround. 
And chapter 6 and verse 4 says we also should walk in newness of life. So the new believer, she or he, walks in the life which is in Christ Jesus. So it's a completely different way of life, one which is God-centered rather than person-centered. And the chapter goes on to say to us just what a big change this is. We actually have to think of ourselves, we have to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and not to let it reign in our lives, not to let it lead us and conquer us. Those who've been doing this for some time know that we have to start at the beginning of the day. When you wake up, you have to think to yourself, I ought to be thinking about godly things today, not uh, just the things which uh, perhaps come into mind when I first <laughs> wake up in the morning. And we have to start at the beginning of the day and carry on and be thinking like this throughout the day. Now, we, we leave busy lives, don't we? And, and sometimes our, our lives are very full and, and there are bound to be moments when uh, we can't stop and think. But as often as we can, we have to think, I ought now to be living and doing these things in the way which Jesus Christ would do them. Verse 16 of the chapter says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves or give yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We have to change masters, the chapter says. In the life before we come into Christ, we are really servants of sin. That's how the Bible describes us. And we have to become servants of righteousness. Servants of God, who is the one who is righteous, and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself has lived the perfect way of righteousness. That's the change that comes in our lives. Well, how do we make such changes? Well, if we're going to stop being slaves to sin or servants of sin, of course, we have to know what sin is. Uh, and the Bible leaves us in no doubt about that. It is disobedience to God. Now, of course, we may not know what God expects of us. So we have to be prepared to learn, don't we? And to read from the Bible what it tells us sin is and what sin is not and what following God is actually mean. So we must learn what God expects of us. The Bible definition of sin is, is very much that, that it is not doing what God says. Now, probably if, if we went out now outside and asked somebody what they, they thought sin of, they, they'd probably think of murder and maybe large-scale theft and various other things, but lots of the things that people do day by day, they probably don't think of as, as sins. But the fact is, isn't it, if I, if I wake up in the morning and think, oh, have I got to work for that awful chap again today, perhaps I'm not really starting off in the right frame of mind. I ought to be thinking, what can I do to set a good example to my rather unreasonable employer today? Or we might wake up and think, oh dear, I haven't got to go to school and listen to that teacher again, have I? Whereas really, we ought to be thinking, well, I can probably learn some good things, actually, if I listen carefully, even though I may not like the way that he or she puts them, puts them over at times or the way they treat me. It's a, it's a whole different way of life, isn't it? One which seeks to follow the example of Jesus, who always, first of all, tried to lead people in the right way, even if they didn't look very likely candidates for, for listening. So we have to know what righteousness is then, and we have to want to make the change, don't we? Because if we don't, we're not going to make very much progress with this new way of life. Well then, we have to read the Bible to find out what God expects of us. And because the Bible is a book for adults, there are things that children can understand, of course, but it is, at the end of the day, a book for adults, then we have to be a little bit grown up if we're going to understand what we read. And that means if we're going to change our old way of life to match the way of life which the Lord Jesus Christ sets before us, then we've got to understand. 
Well, you can perhaps imagine that this was explained to me when I was a little bit older than I had been when, uh, when I was christened, is what it was really. And I came to accept what people told me, that yes, that wasn't baptism, because really I should have understood before baptism was carried out. And yet it is described by many as baptism. It isn't what the Bible calls baptism. Well, let's think now about how baptism itself helps the change. And that will help us, I think, to realise why it is that God has prepared this ceremony, this, this rite. Why he's, he's done it this way. Why he hasn't asked us to do something else instead. Well, Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. So that's how we are to think of baptism. We know, don't we, that you go under the water, and if you stayed under there, you would be dead before very long. Even if you're good at holding your breath for a long time, the time would come when you would run out of breath and you would be dead. So baptism is a very apt symbol of death. But only, of course, if you really go under the water, and I, I didn't when I was christened. So we can see now why God wants it to be complete immersion. As verse 4 says, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So really before we can start this new life, we've got to recognise that the old one is dead, and baptism symbolises that in a very powerful way. And you'll, you'll notice it talks about newness of life, and when we move on to verse 5 of Romans chapter 6, it says, if we have been planted the authorised version books, together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So baptism is also intended to make us think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are two senses, aren't there, in which new life comes. The first one is that when we come up from the water, we should have left behind the old way of life and now be leading a new way of life. But because baptism also represents the, the death of Jesus who was literally buried in the tomb and raised to life again, it should also make us think of resurrection, which is the great Christian hope. And we're reminded of this because Jesus was resurrected. He was brought to life again. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So being baptised and leading the new way of life should encourage us to think of the resurrection of Jesus being something which comes to every true believer. And without it, the significance of baptism is lost and the central hope of the Christian gospel is gone. We must believe in resurrection. Well, let's think for a little while now then about what is true Christian baptism. In other words, how should it be carried out? We've already looked at some of the things we ought to be thinking about when baptism takes place, the effect it should have on our, our lives and our thinking. But we want to take two examples now both from the Acts of the Apostles, and we want to go to chapter 8 first. Now, those of us who are here this morning, we're, we're thinking a little bit about this man, the Ethiopian eunuch, this morning. Let's think about him a little more now. And we want the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8 and verse 26. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So they were in the desert. And he arose, and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, Ethiopians were not generally worshippers of Israel's God, but this man clearly was. And he came up to Jerusalem to worship, which is the city that God appointed for such worship. He was on his way home, 
and he was reading Isaiah the prophet on his way home. The Old Testament, because that would be the, the scriptures that he had. And Philip is told to go and join himself to the chariot, and Philip hears him reading the prophet Isaiah, and asks him the question, do you understand what you are reading? That's in verse 30. And the Ethiopian says, how can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Philip was able to talk to him then about the Lord Jesus Christ, because he read the section which you'll find in Isaiah chapter 53. We won't go there now, but he read the section that said he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Now we are able to look back and think, well, that is a wonderful description of what happened to Jesus, who was led as a lamb to the slaughter when the Jewish people, with the they had to seek the permission of Pontius Pilate to do it, but sought the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did not resist. He was indeed led as a lamb to the slaughter. But obviously the Ethiopian didn't understand this at this time. And verse 34 says, The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? And Philip began to talk to him and preached to him Jesus. We don't know exactly how many scriptures he, he quoted to him, but it says he began there, and uh, chariot travel across the desert is generally pretty slow, so they probably had a fair while to uh, look at these chapters in the prophet Isaiah. But the important thing is that as a result of this, the Ethiopians saw all these things falling into place now, and that which he'd already believed from Isaiah, he now understood and realized that it was leading to, to Jesus. And we see what his conclusion is from this in verse 36. Well, they went on their way and they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? What hinders me to be baptized? So he had realized from the preaching of Philip that baptism was necessary in order that he might see the full significance of these chapters from Isaiah and how they linked up with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Philip says to him in the next verse, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So there was a condition. It wasn't simply a question of uh, recognizing what was meant in a sort of technical sense, was it? He had to actually believe it and believe that this baptism was going to do him some good as he began his life of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. The Ethiopian recognized and that baptism was an essential part of beginning to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can gather from this little chapter two that it wasn't baptism like my christening at all. Uh, they would probably have had some bottles of water, I'm sure, in the, uh, in the chariot. You didn't travel through the, the desert with no water at all, a very hazardous thing to do. But that evidently wasn't sufficient. They stopped when there was enough water for baptism to take place. And we notice that the verse says they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So we can be pretty certain that it was a baptism by immersion, just as we read about in Romans chapter 6. And the Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing, as well he might. And we should rejoice when we come to accept the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized into his name. Well, another example from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Interestingly enough, the, the two people we are looking at are both Gentiles, non-Jews. And here we are concerned with a man called Cornelius. Cornelius. 
And in verse 34 of chapter 10, we read then, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation. He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Feareth him, believeth him, is faithful, and we notice works righteousness. The change that is to take place in our lives with baptism doesn't finish when the the baptism has happened. That's only the beginning, isn't it? One of the things I I always remember when I was baptised by Christadelphians at the age of 18, uh, lots of people come up and, you know, speak and say very nice things to you and encouraging things. But uh, one of the persons there present said to me, you have taken a step in the right direction. And I've always remembered that. And it is something we have to remember, isn't it? Because it's those that fear him and work righteousness who understand the full significance of baptism. Well, the Apostle Peter then preaches to Cornelius Jesus and the significance of that which Jesus did. We'll go on to verse 40. Him, God raised up the third day and showed him openly. In other words, it's the resurrection again, isn't it? It's being referred to. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people, to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead, the living and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness, as Philip had showed to the Ethiopian, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So baptism is necessary then for remission of sins. And then we read on. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles and on Jews was also poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I had a friend who said, well, you know, that's, that's the baptism, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit. But that's evidently not what Peter thought. He says in verse 47, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptised? which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we. So the fact they'd received the Holy Spirit was in no way a substitute for baptism. They still needed to be baptized. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. He came to believe then in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the importance of baptism and its symbolism to illustrate that to us. Now, we've mentioned that there is an attitude of mind, isn't there? Repentance that has to go with baptism. So let's go forward now to the first letter of Peter and chapter 3. Now, in this chapter, Peter is talking... First of all, about what happened in the days of Noah when God sent a flood, and he is likening that to baptism. So in verse 20 we read, When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, Noah preached to the people before the flood came, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So to have a good conscience toward God, we first of all have to believe in the need for our forgiveness of sins. And we have to be resolved in our mind to try and lead a godly life from now on, don't we? And this, of course, reflects also what the Lord Jesus Christ himself said. We'll go back to Mark's Gospel and chapter 16. Here Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's been raised from the dead and he is now giving them their work to do to carry on the the work of preaching the gospel which he had begun. 
Verse 15, Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. So there is the need to believe and to be baptized. These are what are things which are involved in true Christian baptism. Now we'll just add a little bit more to this. Um, I'd like to take you to John's Gospel record in chapter 4. And there's, I believe, an important lesson that comes from this chapter 2. John chapter 4 and verse 1. When, therefore, the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, John the Baptist had also carried it a baptism, but Jesus' baptism was the one which brings salvation, we read on, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Now, we might wonder why the record has put that in, but I believe there is a definite reason for it. It is to show that it did not actually matter who carried out the baptism. The important thing was that those who were baptized believed and repented. There might have been a danger otherwise, might they say, well, I had a better baptism than yours. I was baptized by Jesus. Uh, you were only baptized by Paul. Because that's human nature, isn't it? That, that, that happens. But the Bible makes the point here, and this is a, a lesson which perhaps has not always been learned subsequently. Uh, my wife is quite interested in genealogy, and uh, while discussing things with a friend, uh, they came across a parish record of people who had been half baptized. Well, what a strange thing. You wonder whether it was the top half or the bottom half. Don't you? But it didn't mean that at all. What it meant was that they had not been baptized by ordained ministers. They'd been baptized by a lay person. And so this was a kind of second-rate baptism. And within that church arrangement at that time, that meant there were certain jobs in the church you couldn't do. You couldn't become an ordained minister because you were only half baptized. You had... So we see from that, don't we, that the, the danger of, of reasoning that, you know, it's more effective if somebody does it, which diverts us away from thinking the effectiveness of baptism is do you believe? Do you know what's happening and why it's being done? It's good and right that there should be witnesses there but it's your conscience and your belief that is important when you are baptized. And so if we go back to Acts again in chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They had the right attitude then, didn't they? They recognized that they were guilty, that they were sinners as we all are, and that they needed to do something about it because of the work which God has done with Jesus. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So repentance was necessary, and baptism in order that they might have their sins forgiven. Well, let's just summarize the, the things which we've, we've looked at now. Baptism helps us to understand the Christian life. It is an important right itself, but it should make us think about that change of life which has to come about if we're going to become Christians. For that to be so, we have to believe and we have to repent of the old way of life. Otherwise, the change hasn't really taken place, has it? And this means recognizing what sin is and its wages, death, which we read about at the very end of Romans chapter 6. 
We have to recognize that sin leads to death inevitably. We have to recognize that if it's indeed going to represent the things which it's intended to, then baptism must be by immersion in order to show the death of the old way of life. It must be by immersion to show resurrection from the grave, both in the change of life and the hope that the believer has of resurrection when Jesus returns again. And it has to be for believing and committed adults, and not for babies as I was when I was christened, because it is vital that we understand these things and their significance. Thank you very much for listening.